Health's webpage uh, after the session has concluded. So thanks for your patience as you hear the, the notification popping up and popping out away. Um, this shall be really the only time that we hear that recording or that, that voice. Uh, thank you, Adugna, for sharing into chat. Uh, welcome. We do invite everyone else who's in the space to do go ahead and follow uh, Adugna's lead and share where you're joining from and the name of your organization that you work with. Hello, thank you for joining us for those of you who are just hopping on. Welcome to this virtual space today. Uh, you'll see some instructions on the screen that invite you to uh, enable your chat bar by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. And we do ask that when you do type into chat, do go ahead and start sharing um, your organization where you work, where you're joining us from. And you will also see we have a poll window on the screen available for you to please go ahead and select the radial buttons that best correspond with your responses. Um, we still have a few moments as we're waiting for our other colleagues to join us. But in the meantime, we also invite you to enable closed captioning today, if you would like to see the subtitles to this session, you may do so by following the instructions on the bottom right of your screen.
Welcome, my friends. Thank you for joining today. We still have about one more minute or a couple minutes until we are scheduled to start the session. Uh, for the time being, please do fill out the poll that you see on the screen. We have a couple of questions for you in that small window. Um, and you may also enable your chat button or your chat uh, panel by selecting the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and do enter your organization and where you're joining us from, please. Okay, my friends, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are at the top of the hour, so we will begin today's session. On behalf of the production team today, I'll invite us to please stop sharing our music. Um, let us share the results of those polls and I would love to uh, thank those of you who, who participated in this. And I would love to introduce our moderator for today's session, Paul Fekete. Uh, Paul serves as the Senior International Trade Advisor for USAID's Center for Economics and Market Development, which is within the Bureau for Development, Democracy and Innovation, or DDI. Let's dive into the session now. Paul, on over to you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Yanina, and uh, good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, as uh, Yanina said, I'm uh, Paul Fekete, a Senior International Trade Advisor in the uh, Center for Economics and Market Development. Uh, welcome to our session with speakers from the International Trade Center in Geneva. USAID has had a longstanding relationship with the ITC, which is a unique international organization because it is sponsored jointly uh, by the World Trade Organization and the United Nations and focuses solely on supporting the small and medium enterprise community. Uh, the ITC is a USAID grantee and has a variety of activities that can complement USAID activities and initiatives, uh, particularly as they support SMEs, which will be the focus of our program today. Uh, but before we get to our presentations, uh, I'd like to welcome the Market Links community. Uh, this July, Market Links will be exploring current trends and key issues in international trade, and we'll be offering examples of how to harness USAID's tools and resources towards achieving economic development goals. Uh, each week in July, we'll be featuring a different case study within the international trade context, giving the Market Links community an in-depth look at the solutions used to solve current issues. Because trade is such a multifaceted topic, each weekly example will provide a unique perspective and build a holistic understanding of the global trade environment. We have a wide range of uh, content scheduled for this month, authored by a diverse panel of trade experts from our office and elsewhere. And uh, here's a preview of what you can expect. Uh, we'll be doing a study on how enhanced regulatory accountability uh, can help enable startup opportunities, an examination of how international standards have adapted to meet the demands of a post-pandemic workforce, focusing on building resiliency while advancing safety in the construction industry, an examination of how drones are evolving within supply chains and their potential impact on trade logistics. Uh, key findings from a USAID study on how the WTO's trade facilitation agreement benefits the MSME community through increased transparency, efficiency, and competitiveness. And best practices to harness the potential of the evolving e-commerce landscape and how it can further promote trade facilitation. Over the course of the last year, we've held a series of sessions for USAID staff focusing on the evolution of the digital economy and on the importance of logistics uh, to e-commerce. In May, we held our first event with the ITC for USAID officers, which highlighted the work that the ITC has been doing in support of MSA, SMA, SMEs and their ability 
uh, to take advantage of the burgeoning world of digital trade and e-commerce platform. All of these online sessions are designed to support and strengthen the work that USAID, is, that USAID does around the world in these areas. And for USAID staff, they are available uh, in ProgramNet. Today, though, we will focus on the ITC's trade and market intelligence tools. Uh, one of the tenets of USAID's trade capacity building policy is that work we do is to enhance countries and businesses' economic responsiveness, the ability to take advantage of trade agreements and the policy environment in which enterprises operate. This is where our focus will be today. The ITC's tools that enable business actors to identify export and import opportunities uh, compare market access requirements, monitor national trade performance, and make well-informed trade decisions. We're delighted to have two speakers today with us uh, from the ITC who will be focusing on these capabilities. Uh, first, we have Monter Minumi, who serves as the Chief of Trade and Market Intelligence at the ITC and leads programs on transparency and trade, competitive intelligence, and non-tariff barriers. He has built several web applications to improve trade transparency and assess the export performance and competitiveness of countries. Monter has also contributed to a variety of joint market analysis projects of the ITC, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD, uh, the WTO, and the World Economic Forum. Our second speaker will be Ursula Hermelink, who heads ITC's program on non-tariff measures. Ursula joined IC, ITC's Trade and Market Intelligence section in 2010 and has since been focusing on market access issues, including trade agreements, tariffs, and non-tariff measures. She has led the implementation of ITC's private sector surveys on non-tariff measures in numerous developing countries and contributed to a number of publications, including the ITC's publication series on non-tariff measures. Uh, prior to her work with the ITC, she held various assignments in the United Nations system. With these brief introductions, uh, let me turn the floor over to Monter for some introductory comments about the ITC and then for his and Ursula's presentations on the ITC suite of market analysis tools. Over to you, Monter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thanks for giving us this opportunity to present and discuss with you what we are doing in the area of trade and market intelligence. I'll try to share my screen. I hope that you... Do you see my screen? Yes, we do, Monheer. Perfect. Then uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where you are. Uh, as uh, explained and presented by uh, Paul, um, and for those of you who no are not familiar with ITC, ITC, in fact, is a joint UN WTO organization uh, with a clear mandate to promote trade and support improving international competitiveness of SMEs in developing and transitional economy. And we are doing it also for developed countries and this is really great for us. We work closely with various stakeholders, uh, mainly policy maker, trade support institution, trade investment institution, businesses, uh, the researcher, and among others. And we work mainly in uh, six focus area. Then the first area, the area that we will discuss today, it's about trade, uh, trade intelligence. The second area is about improving the business environment through policy or through action of the, the, the field. Uh, the third area is about strengthening the trade investment support institution. And as you know, we cannot promote trade if we don't have heavy uh, investment mechanism in the country. Uh, the, the number four is about the value chain, and this is one key activity now, and we are asked by all countries to help them moving up in the value chain, and we are even developing some projects on regional and continental value chain, and uh, something that we are developing now, and the idea is to support EU identifying the key sectors where they will invest in Africa. Uh, in order to, uh, to consolidate the African CFTA or the African F Continental Free Trade Agreement. But the idea is not to promote our value chain with basic sector, but to move up and to come with innovative sector, including the medical sector, as you know, after what we have seen during the last 18 months. The, the area number five is about gender mainstreaming and uh, inclusive growth. Then we have, we are targeting 
uh, the, the gender, how to promote gender. And we have, we, do, we have different elements that we are implementing and working extremely well. Uh, and we are also working closely with you on the sustainable development. And the last one, last and not least, is about uh, regional integration, the South-South integration. But now we know that the, the South-South trade is above 50% of the international trade, but still some countries are excluded from that. And we have uh, many projects in order to foster and to, 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 to help the, this South-South integration. In all this area, we are working closely, as I said, with uh, trade and investment support institution, our key stakeholder, but also with MSMEs and policymaker among the, and for sure, all the development agency, national and international agency. Then today we will focus on the first area, then on it's and somehow, it's not the area that we are working, it's, it's the raison d'etre of ITC when ITC was created in 64. The, the idea was to have an institution able to improve the transparency and to reduce the transaction costs. Then, uh, in fact, the trade and market intelligence is quite uh, challenging to, to cover it very well. And in fact, we are doing it for the last 20 years in five uh, different areas. The first one, the most known one in ITC is what we call the trade information and the global public good. We have a large set of uh, public good that I will present later on uh, briefly. And the idea is really to help the businesses and policymakers as well, going through the full export and port journey, but also investment uh, procurement and other. But the idea is really to, to, to help the, 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 all the, the actors, economic actor, to get the most relevant economic information. Then, and this area is quite specialized. Then in order to make this usable by all, and especially MSMEs, where there is very often uh, weak expertise, then we have some tailor-made activities and some integrated solution on competitive intelligence that I will try to present also briefly. This is our two, uh, two uh, first area about disseminating the information. The third area, one extremely important area that uh, Ursula, my colleague, will present uh, later on is about the country diagnostic. In fact, we know that you have so many programs in the field, but very often without really knowing extremely well the country. If we don't understand exactly the bottlenecks that the country is facing, the sectors, the regions are facing, uh, the, then it's extremely difficult to handle and to, to, to remove and overcome the barriers. Then, in fact, under this area, we try to identify the potential that the country may have, but for this potential, you have problems. We try to identify them as well and come with recommendation. And that's really an excellent business diagnostic that we are now developing further and going to the value chain uh, development in line with the business diagnostic. And in fact, you know, even if you have, you are successful with the global public good, we have more than 1 million users around the world, but the capacity yeah, building... Most people in Tokosan have reached an A1C under 7 and maintained it, and you made it lose weight. Adults lost on average up to 12 pounds. I think there is a problem. No, voice. Could you hear me? We can just hear you now. Yes, thank you, Monter. Um, please, we do invite everyone to keep their microphones on mute for this webinar. Except if it is a nice music. <laughs> thank you, Monter. Yeah. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Zen. Uh, then, in fact, uh, you know, covering so many countries, it's difficult to, to have this technical uh, assistance. Then what we are doing, we are, we are developing a large uh, network of multiplier and we count a lot on our capacity building. The idea is to have multiplier able to duplicate what we are doing in more countries and more regions. Then this is the, the four area that we are covering. And the last one is about, um, we try to adapt ourselves. You have always new requests and we have this uh, tailored services analysis among them. Recently, we developed, um, you know, during the, the African CFTA negotiation, we have seen that the negotiation were blocked and we were approached by some donor like GIZ and EU to develop an online trade negotiation tool. And that now all the chief negotiators in Africa are using. We have done this for goods. 
uh, we are helping on the services. Uh, we were asked by uh, also a donor to, we are talking about women empowerment, but how can we assess this? And we developed something that we call now uh, the gender outlook or she trade outlook. Uh, and we, we are quite proud because during the last G7, it was mentioned as a successful example of the, the, the outlook, how can we assess gender empowerment in order to identify where we need to act. And this is the research area that we are doing and we tailor made depending on the needs and we need, as you know, to adapt ourselves to the countries. Then now with all these tools and information, then if we have, if we see uh, something coming from our last, uh, lastly developed uh, application called Trade Brief, we have seen that Till May and April, we have seen uh, the trade bouncing back. Then how can we take the, use the opportunity? How can we support the, 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 the different stakeholders uh, taking advantage of these emerging opportunities? And in fact, we try to answer with all our uh, tools and support and services, we try to answer through three different channels. The first one, is, as uh, I said before, it's to help them navigating through the export journey, giving them all the elements that they need to get in order to, to have an extremely good inter uh, understanding of what's going on and what kind of opportunity, what kind of challenges, what kind of barriers, what can all these kind of things that are crucial for any businesses. Then we are also uh, helping through the second channel that uh, Ursula will present on enhancing this transparency and dialogue. Uh, and the third one, it's we are helping also, the, especially the policy maker and all the decision maker and evidence-based policy and evidence-based decision. And the idea is it's easy to take a decision, but with evidence-based decision, it's always much better than you have much uh, Stronger impact. No, I started my wife. Yeah. Then starting with the first one, the first of the three, then what we call this, this navigating uh, the full export journey. In fact, during the last 20 years in ITC, we developed a set of tools that you can find under ITC market analysis tools. Now it's we are quite, uh, quite proud. Now, last year we reached our 1 million users. Registered user, we have much more not registered, but we have more than 1 million registered user. And the idea under this set of tools, it's to help them assessing the, the world demand, assessing the opportunities, exploring all the market condition about NTM, about barriers, about obstacle, about procedures, about um, notification, about uh, procurement, about then it's really, we try to cover the full set of information. We started with, uh, one application called uh, trade map that I will present, then we move it to Mac map. We have seen that the, giving the trade information, giving the market access information or tariff and is not enough. There is request on rules of origin with what Ursula will present later on. We have done a survey in more than 30 country, uh, 70 countries and we have seen that rules of origin are among the key obstacles that uh, the exporter and importer face. Then we said that let's handle this and we managed to develop a new taxonomy for this adopted by WCO. Then depending on the needs, we try to adapt ourselves, even the prices. In some countries, the exporter are really facing problem with the, this big buyer forcing them to accept any price. Then we developed for them an application to give them real time data on prices and also to, to allow them to exchange the prices and the, the input prices between the different cooperatives in order to align the, the, the selling price. Then, and this is our set of uh, the, the information. Then I'll, I'll start with the first one, the most known one, then uh, trade map, uh, it's, I think it's the largest uh, trade data application in the world. Um, we have more than uh, 191 countries reporting with more than 100 countries reporting monthly in that now we have a gap of two to three months. And you know, it's quite challenging to have two to three months uh, data for more than 100 country. And this is what we managed to do uh, with uh, trade map. We used in the past, we have in UN, we have what we call Comtrade. But the problem with Comtrade, we, we are at the, what we call six digit, meaning that we are not at the very, very detailed product. 
We are at the international nomenclature, not the national one. And we have a gap of two years. And when you work with the business sector, two years for them is history. It's They would like to get the most up-to-date information. If you'd like to get the information for tomorrow, not last year. And then this is why we started this effort to collect ourselves the data. And then it's not only about trade data and transaction, but it's also about company, company data. We have more than nearly 2 million uh, company contact in order to facilitate the B2B. And extremely pleased if you, we have time to present to you more deeply this. I will give an example later on, but integrating all the tools, not going through with them one by one. Then the second one is about market access, a tariff. As you know, all countries are supposed to notify WTO with their MFN. But even with that, only 40 to 45 are notifying. And we are talking about MFN. We are not doing, talking about all the preferences. And, and we know that the trade is managed by preferences and not by the MFN. The material. Then, in fact, what we managed to do is to go to the field and to collect the information ourselves. And now we have more than 200 countries covered. And we share this information once once a year with WTO. And the idea is really to improve the trade information on tariff, trade, quota, non-tariff measures, SPS, TBT, and other. And in fact, now we are, thanks to your support, we are going even deeper. What we used to have under the international nomenclature, we used to stop somewhere. It's, we stop, We used to have maximum residue limit, and we stopped there. Now, thanks to the, the, the funding that we got, from USAID for all the measures that we have, we go much deeper than in this case, for example, we can analyze the, the, the tolerance limit for United States for a given product and or USA, uh, EU, you can compare with uh, Codex Alimentarius and then you can even assess yourself and see if your product is uh, in line or not with the, uh, the national norms and standards. Then one very important tool that we have now, it's export potential map. And this is, this we developed this tool, in fact, to, to help countries. We have seen that there is a weak capacity on identifying opportunities and how to diversify our production, our export, and our partner. And this is the key uh, mandate of this application. Then it's about really helping to identify the, 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 the opportunities on how to diversify your export, how even to, to diversify your uh, structure of export. And this we are using now an extension of this application and the value chain. I mean that based on the allocation of resources, how can you move up in the value chain and even create new products? Then I will not go through all the tools. Then. We have, as I said uh, before, the rules of origin facilitator, where you have now, um, in fact, it's not 150, it's 350 uh, trade agreement. As you know, we have around 458 trade agreement in the world, and we so far covered around 350 uh, trade agreement with all provision at the product level. I mean that when you go there at the product level, you can see what what the rules of origin mean for this product, if you can accumulate or not, if you have regional accumulation, if the, 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 all the information about the, the rules of origin. Uh, then we have, as you know, the largest market in the world is public procurement. Then we developed an application to support MSMEs on procurement map. And we have every day 150,000 valid uh, procurement where an SME can apply and go there, uh, identify the product that they would like to sell or to eat, and then they can even apply. We are working on investment. We are working also on sustainable standards. You know that the SPS, TBT are not the only mechanism that we have to control the market. We have now the voluntary standards, and that's why we started working on this uh, area. Then uh, among the, the application, we developed now the market price information with real-time price for 300 uh, products, but we have this, the, the prices by state for US, for example, depending on the state, depending on the packaging, depending on the labor that you have, the label that you have, then we can see the different prices. <clears throat> then based on that, we have, um, uh, we have uh, different regional uh, application that we developed with all the information that we have, like, Euromed, we have done something to integrate the Euro Mediterranean countries, Central Asia, Eastern Europe. We are working also 
at the national level to boost the competitiveness, working on investment, and the, the idea also we are working at the sectoral level like the cotton and others. And the idea is really to support the different requests. Now I will go very briefly and very quickly through an application that we developed uh, in this line, but rather than really with this application, we are focusing on the MSMEs. The idea is to help the businesses. And we know that they are not very knowledgeable about the different rules and regulation. And then we try to pre-prepare pre all the information for them and or cook the information and present them. If I will just very briefly, in fact, we have this application, as you can see, in six languages. Uh, most of the information is coming from ITC, and we managed to integrate uh, the information from 11 other international organizations like WTO, World Bank, UNCTAD, WIPO, and others in order to help the businesses. Let's take an example. For example, if we select someone from uh, Kenya, would like to export macadamia. Then, and I don't know to which market I would like to export. If I know my market, I can select the market. If I don't know, I can ask which market is the most interesting. And this, I see that the US market is the most interesting one. And I select the US where with the highest potential for me. And then I go there. And then I have in a few seconds, I have a quick market overview that you will spend weeks and weeks to, to, to get this information. And this market overview, and then you go, deep, depending on the tabs, you can go much, much deeper. Then what I can see here that the US is importing $143 million a year. It's ranked number one in the world. I can see that Kenya export already 29%, or they have the market share of Kenya is 29% in the US market. The market is still growing, I'm growing there, and I'm exporting for the time being 21.7, uh, I'm exporting 42 million, and they have still 21 million potential that they can export in the near future if there is. Uh, then for that, I need to know more information about the market access. Then I can see that there is two tariffs, 0, 04 and 0, depending on the MFN or the, the, the uh, Agoa. Then, and in order to export there, there is some mandatory requirement. And then I have all the mandatory here about product requirement. There is 27. Marked condition, there is five. Pre shipment inspection, I have 24. Uh, notified regulation, I have 110 in total. Then, and I can go later on in each of them. Uh, I have uh, 27 sustainable standard with macadamia then it depends for some companies they it's mandatory to follow some standards i can go there and select the, the the standard and then if i would like to see the procedures is it easy to export there i can see that it takes between 60 days to 138 days to do all the procedures to export for the first time then you have uh, 15 tasks required 53 documents uh, 21 uh, entities involved and it costs around 15000 shilling then and um, if I would like to see if there is any institution that we can approach, then you have uh, the business directory with 40 companies in the US. I have uh, one institution in charge of trade finance in Kenya, uh, two in promotion organization in Kenya, and there is two intellectual property for macadamia on the export from Kenya. Then, in fact, now you, need, you can go uh, much deeper. You can select the tariff, then you will have more information about the tariff, the trade agreement, the, 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 if you select the, the ad valorem equivalent because the tariff here is in tariff specific, specific tariff, then we need to calculate the ad valorem equivalent. Uh, I need to see the regulation, then there is some domestic regulation in Kenya. You can see that the, the domestic regulation 
And if I select one of them, I will go to the text. I will have all the phytosanitary certification system. I can go there and I have all the information about that. And for all the measures, you have all this kind of information. I will not go. And then for the sustainable standard as well, this is all the, the sustainable standard or standards that you need to have, or if you have them, it will facilitate your access to the, the American market. If you'd like to see the different steps, then you click here and you will see the 15 different steps that you need to follow. And under each step, you have the institution applied, you have the time, you have the, the cost and which certificate, the, the, the validity of that, the company in charge, then all the information that you need for every step and all the relevant contact in order to, to, to export, the required document that you need to get in order to export and if there is any intellectual uh, property right, you can see it here. For the partner, you can see also, if you'd like to export, you can see the partner, the companies, it's, this is the B2B dimension. It means that in a few minutes, you have this tour and without having any knowledge on the international trade, you can get all this information. And if you log in, you can get the company contact and you have the, some contact and you have the, 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 the size of the company, all the information about the company. Uh, I hope that I'm fine with the time. I, then, um, in fact, I tried to be uh, brief on that. And the idea under this uh, tool, as I said, is really to help the, the MSMEs uh, getting all the information that they are looking for in order to export and to, to reduce the transaction cost. Uh, my colleague uh, Ursula will move to the, the second and third uh, channel that we are using to, to, to improve this transparency and reduce the cost. Um, Ursula, the floor is yours, Ursula. Thank you very much. Um, let me just open my video. Um, so um, welcome everybody also from my side. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for getting up early or staying up late um, for us uh, here. So I will move to uh, the second part of the presentation, sharing a little bit more um, about um, yeah, I mean, so far, I mean, Wonderworks was mentioning the tools that we have in terms of providing data in a way in a, in a passive format, right? We, we have the databases, we have trade market access map, the global trade hub desk that are out there for you, uh, for your clients to use. Um, now, in the second part, I would like to move to a tool, um, uh, to, to two tools in particular that allow some sort of exchange of information. So it's not only we provide information to an anonymous user, but there's some exchange between um, the provider of the information and the user of the information. Um, let me just open um, the screen. There we go. I hope you can see it. Can somebody confirm that you can see the slides? We can see your slide, Ursula. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so in the second part, as I said, I would want to um, look at two tools in particular, um, the first one being ePing and the second one being the Trade Obstacles Alert Mechanism. Um, now, ePing responds to something that you will have heard a lot as well in your work, uh, something like this. Um, countries change their laws so quickly, how can I keep up? This is something that we're hearing a lot. Now, ePing has been designed to help in that quest. Um, it alerts users this could be companies, it could be policymakers, about changes in regulations as notified by WTO members, notably on SPS, so sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and TBT, technical barriers to trade. And these alerts are sent for products and markets of interest to the user. So you can identify yourself and you can say, I'm interested in fish and the United States, for example. So whenever the United States issues a notification that uh, applies to fish or fish products, I would get an email alert uh, showing me that notification. Now, what does this allow us to do? It's again, this passive information. It allows us a user uh, uh, to give a user information about relevant regulatory changes. Um, and allow them uh, to take action to adjust. If you know the notifications, they are issued 
all, often in advance of implementation, if it's not an emergency measure. Now, emergency measures we've seen a lot last year with COVID, but let's assume it's, it's, it's a normal SPS measure. Uh, usually there's some sort of advance notice. So actually companies could see, oh, the United States is changing this and that regulation. I may need to adapt to my production or my packaging uh, to, to be compliant with that. Now, where comes the interaction and, and the information exchange aspect into it is what the policymakers can then do and how companies can get in touch with policymakers. So in EPING, there's a uh, built-in uh, function where if the company realizes hmm, if the United States um, implements this um, regulation, I will no longer be able to export for whatever reason. They can contact their inquiry points um, and let them know and say, listen, uh, I have a concern with this because of um, this and that impact that this will have on me. Um, so companies can report back and also the inquiry points can get actively in touch with companies in their countries. In many countries we uh, have seen and we've talked to WTO inquiry points, they have never interacted with businesses. They don't even know where to find them in the different sectors. So EPING allows them to do that and they can actually send out information to uh, their national forum to the national companies to inform them of important changes. What is also important is that they can upload additional information. So WTO notifications come, unfortunately, only in three languages, uh, English, French, and Spanish. Um, and unfortunately to many non-lawyers in uh, this universe, and of, there's a lot of non-lawyers around there, they come in legal language. So it's lawyers that draft those notifications and SMEs sometimes have no idea what they are trying to tell them when they say uh, superseding paragraph 3.7 of the past resolution of 1973.7 until it gets to the nitty gritty bits of what is actually relevant to them, they, they will not see um, uh, really the information content. Um, so policymakers can actually upload information and say, listen, uh, the US has issued a regulation for you, that means that as of December, uh, all fish products have to be uh, packaged in purple packages, for example, really drilling it down to the essential bits for the businesses. Um, again, there's an alert function in there. So if you're interested in fish in the United States, you will get an email alert when such uh, an additional information is being uploaded or a comment. Now, we have used this functionality to go a step further to bring the information to businesses um, in a more systematic way. And we are piloting currently something in Vietnam where we enable a partnership between the inquiry points, between the sector associations and um, uh, academia where students of the foreign trade university actually uh, as part of their curriculum take priority notifications for Vietnam. So not all 6,000 a year, but really only for few products and markets of high interest. And they are translating them into Vietnamese, but also into business language, and then upload them into EPING to really bring the information closer to SMEs in Vietnam and to make this information more understood. Um, so thanks to that, um, um, Here's just a quote from, from uh, a business, or, um, business organization representative, a, a sector uh, association in Uganda. This allows get, getting timely information, uh, sharing it with members, engage in discussions, and help members also in terms of preparing for compliance to a certain regulation. So this is just one example of a transparency tool where we use data, but also to, to help bring it closer to the clients, but also uh, help clients to feedback any concerns that they may have. The second um, such tool that I wanted to mention is in a way the other way around. So here we had the policymaker, submitting an information and transmitting an information, the, the regulation, and getting feedback. Now here it's the other way around. Here it's the private sector that is at the origin of the information and who feeds it to uh, the policymaker. And the example being the trade obstacles alert mechanism um, that we started implementing in a, a number of countries, which is an online platform that connects companies and relevant agency, uh, agencies, allowing them to exchange information again about trade obstacles. And behind this uh, online mechanism is an institutional mechanism that is being built. That's the harder part, <laughs> having the online platform um, that responds to those queries. Usually in the case of trading goods, 
This is closely linked or is the trade facilitation committee that takes up those obstacles and responds to them, but it uh, depends a little bit on the sectors and it depends on the countries. Why did we um, build those mechanisms? In many countries, you have public private dialogues in some form, but usually they are in what we call classic form. So they go to business associations, um, uh, through through chambers of commerce, for example, or public consultation session where people can come and then speak up and 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 uh, discuss, for example, new policies uh, or any concerns that they have. But we do know also for a fact that those classic channels of public-private dialogue are not necessarily inclusive and representative of the varied variety of businesses that you have, and particularly certain types of businesses are not networking sufficiently to, through chambers of commerce or are not organized in the same way as larger companies are. For example, the smaller and medium-sized micros companies are not always members of chambers of commerce and sector associations. We also know that women-led companies or women are less uh, organized in these formal networks. And also these companies are less likely to go to public consultations and they don't dare to speak up sometimes simply because they think they don't have anything relevant to share. So having an, a complementary system like the trade obstacles alert mechanism that allows a user to stay anonymous and to report the concerns that they have to feed it into national policy making, let's say, and flag to policymakers issues of their concern is um, very important. Um, what uh, I won't go into detail on, on the mechanism itself, but maybe just flag here that um, these reports are being made public. So again, as for EPING, when a user sends a certain concern, for example, for fish products exported to the United States, saying I'm uh, facing a problem with uh, the recognition of my certificate, SPS certificate um, in the United States, this concern, once validated, is being publicly available. So others can see that. And again, alert function, you can sign up and get email alerts uh, if you're interested as well in United States and fish, you will see that somebody else posted a concern, again, flagging and signaling, hey, there might be a problem that you may also face currently or in future. So again, there's the transparency mechanism built in to share information um, to those um, who, who would need to have it. Um, Usually these are national mechanisms that we build, but they can also be connected in uh, regionally. I saw some uh, participants from Guinea, I think, and, and uh, West Africa. So you may know uh, the regional um, trade obstacles alert mechanism in West Africa that we are currently also expanding to, to uh, the entire ECOWAS region. Um, so where actually the national mechanisms um, allow companies to uh, flag concerns, for example, about national procedures and all of that. However, if it if the concern really relates to a partner country regulation or a way that they are applying it, these concerns can be forwarded also to other countries. In the case of the AFCA, to you also uh, AFCFTA, you may also know that there's an Africa-wide trade barriers reporting system. So whenever there's something that should be taken up at the monitoring level, um, at the All Africa level, for example, at the AFCFTA Secretariat, these uh, national mechanisms feed into this uh, continent-wide barriers reporting system. And that leads me to the last uh, section of our presentation before we then open the floor uh, for questions and answers, which is how trade intelligence and how the different tools and, and, and services that we have can support evidence-based um, policies. And there I want to highlight three um, services that we, we are providing and tools that we are having um, around the business surveys that we are running, um, the trade analysis, the targeted trade analysis that we are doing um, upon request, um, and also Monda Brent mentioned it very briefly in the beginning, the um, monitoring like the um, African Trade Observatory monitoring of continental, for example, integration in this case in um, Africa. Um, why um, do you need all that? Well, policymakers, we know, need all sorts of information to take good decisions uh, in, in trade policy making. And it's the same in a way for us as providers of trade related technical assistance. So a policymaker may wish to know if they have a gender mainstreaming policy to start with how many exporting businesses are women led and where they are in which sectors, the same for use. Uh, um, they may wish to know how much of the trade potential they're having and how much of it remains unused today. Uh, they may wish to know that um, rules of origin are a big challenge uh, for, for, for businesses, uh, nearly as challenging as SPS and TBT measures. 
And when designing the, the appropriate trade facilitation measures, they may wish to know that procedures and not the regulations are usually the bigger challenge for exporters and importers. So that gives some elements for, to, uh, to help prioritizing which actions are most needed. They may wish to know what effect will have the implementation of a trade agreement in terms of boosting trade, in terms of creating jobs. Um, this is important information not only uh, in the decision whether or not to engage in a, a trade negotiation or in, in the signing of a trade agreement, but also to get support from the public, from civil society, from business community in implementing a certain trade agreement. And finally, this is informa in interesting information to have as well. 50% of micro and small companies never report trade obstacles they face. And what does that mean for the effectiveness of your public-private dialogue mechanisms? So the good news is that all of these elements that you're seeing here on the slide are things that we are numbers that we are producing uh, through the different tools and methods that we are applying. And I would want to start with the business surveys that uh, some of you may have come across already, um, where we really attempt to capture the voice of SMEs on the ground and bringing it up right to the policy making table where it needs to be heard. It's in a way similar to what I presented earlier, the trade obstacles alert. However, it is the survey is um, a representative snapshot in time of the landscape of exporters and importers in a given country. So the trade obstacles alert is a passive users decide to report something on the day that something happens and that could happen throughout the year. Now a survey is really representative at a given point in time by sector to understand what are the trade barriers that uh, businesses encounter. So we're not talking about uh, three or four interviews, we are talking about 100 uh, per sector in a country to really understand what are the obstacles and how, uh, what are the priorities for businesses and what needs to be done about them. So what we are capturing through those surveys is an enormous amount of detail. I won't go uh, over all of those, but just for you to, to know, we look at uh, the product at the most detailed level that they are being exported or imported or services activity. So when we, for example, look at the tourism sector, uh, is it a provider of accommodation services? Is it a tour guide, et cetera, et cetera. In the case of services, we know the mode of supply. Um, we know the market, so the partner country, so export destination, import origin, or in the case of services, the origin of the foreign client. And for each pair, let's say, of product and partner countries, so for example, I export fish from Uganda to the United States and to Liechtenstein, let's say, um, and it's, it's fresh and frozen fish. Uh, I, we, we are asking whether it, for the pair of fresh fish to the United States, you face an obstacle, and the company may say no. Uh, but for frozen fish and the United States, yes, there may be an issue. For fresh fish to Liechtenstein, yes, there may be an is issue. For frozen fish, maybe not. So really, by detailed level of product and partner country, not at the level of the company, but really by product and partner country, we try to understand whether there's an obstacle to start with, and then drilling deeper into what type of obstacle there is. Is it a regulation? Is it a procedure? Is it a combination of both? Is it lack of information? Issues related to the business environment, etc. And most importantly, also the company's recommendation, what change they would like to see, to see this addressed. Um, because that is then the basis for the next step, which is the consultation, the, the, the public-private dialogue process that these results should feed into. Sometimes we are leading them uh, ourselves. Often these surveys uh, feed into the design of export strategies or the implementation of trade uh, projects, such as, for example, for USAID, we did a bit work, for example, in Arab states for regional integration that fed into USAID-led projects um, for trade facilitation implementation. Now, as a byproduct, just flagging here, we are collecting a lot of company characteristics, um, which is quite interesting and gives us unprecedented insights that can be used in countries where you are working, uh, to the extent that we have already done surveys, um, getting us all sorts of information about what, who are the companies and what are they doing, where are they, who are they trading with. Just some numbers. Uh, to date, we surveyed over 35,000 exporters and importers across 73 countries. Many, I saw Philippines, somebody's from Ghana, I saw um, some somebody from Guinea, um, Kenya. So these are all countries that we have already covered. So if you're interested, I invite you to also look at our website or contact us. Um, as I said, creating unprecedented insights, adapting to emerging needs and uh, allowing for impact on the ground. 
I mentioned the insights on company characteristics. So as a byproduct in a way of these surveys, we now have data on the share of women-led enterprises by company size and sector. Could be interesting to use in project design and trade strategies. We have specifically designed surveys to understand differences in accessing markets uh, and the difficulty thereof between women and men-led firms and whether trade barriers are actually different between both. Um, maybe on services trade, you may know trade statistics on services is for developing country not very well developed. So as part of the surveys, we're asking about what service activity a business has and also the partner countries, so the, the foreign clients that they're having, adding some information that may not be available through official statistics. Um, Adapting to emerging needs to showing that at the moment, for example, we have questions in our surveys on how companies survived COVID basically, because if we're talking to them nowadays, it means that they're still there. So we want to know what helped them uh, mitigate the impact of the COVID crisis and the economic crisis um, uh, and feed that information also back to governments who want to see what measures have been effective in helping them survive. Um, for greater impact on the ground, well, um, what does this lead to in the end? As I said, it's not a study, it's not a research exercise, it needs to feed into action. And here's just an example of what had happened in Mauritius after our survey, where they realized they had import licensing requirements that dated back from the 1950s and nobody ever understood any longer for what reason they had ever been introduced. So these have been, after the survey, eliminated, reducing significantly the time and cost of importing, in this case, certain um, products. So this is the kind of impact that we are looking for, that we are striving to support. Second, um, on the analysis, tailored analysis, just four examples of the types of analysis that we do ourselves. Now you look, you saw the databases, so you can use them. You can do all sorts of analysis with the data that is out there, but we are also applying, uh, doing applied research based on the data and insight that we're having. Just giving you four examples of recent analyses that we have been doing that has been uh, commissioned to us was for example, to analyze the opportunities for services exports in Greece. Um, we also looked recently at the effect of the graduation from LDC status for um, Laos, um, for Laos, um, looking at the effect in terms of uh, potential trade losses, but also uh, compensatory strategies in terms of market diversification, for example, looking at then again at the export and the unused export uh, potential. We've been looking, for example, in Jordan, I saw there was a participant from Jordan, I think, um, on the regional export growth potential uh, and how many jobs this could generate if it was a realized potential. And maybe um, talking more about the COVID context, we looked, for example, in how regional cooperation could support the development of value chains. And here, I mean, we, we did an analysis last year on um, the, how, um, how Africa could, for example, produce the amount uh, of disinfectants that are needed to help uh, fight the pandemic. So here uh, you look at the different inputs, ethanol, glycerin, the plastic caps, the bottles, we looked, where can they be sourced from, also in intra-regional trade, and how can value chains be built? Now on this value chain, um, as Monder said uh, earlier in the introduction, we are, uh, a big supporter of uh, getting creative and really looking beyond what's already there. So to our taste, far too often projects, uh, projects, um, also governments and the export strategies um, support what is already there, the, the traditional value chains and, and are not daring looking what could be there if we were investing the right things. And our data and analysis, we hope, uh, supports identifying promising value chains that um, that are not yet um, being developed and also the potential for integration regionally and again in the AFCFTA context that can be uh, interesting for countries to co cooperate on building these value chains. So basically we know that if you produce A and B you could also produce C um, and maybe to produce C or D or even in, in a more value uh, added product, you may need so, to source some additional inputs that you can get from regional suppliers, for example, in Africa. And to really look a little bit beyond what's happening already to what could happen, how to really diversify um, also products um, and move up the value chain for different, um, um, uh, for different countries and for countries to cooperate together. Um, 
that is based on the data analysis. Then we have also the validation and that where the survey aspect comes in. Um, so if we know you do A and B, you could already also do C, we have to ask businesses, why doesn't it happen yet? And really understand what are the current bottlenecks from that value chain, this promising value chain for actually being developed um, to understand what are the investment needs, what are the capacity building and the skills that need to be built to make this actually happen and what are the trade barriers that are currently encountered. So this just to flag how the data and methodologies can be used to inform, for example, again, the design of strategies or investment uh, priorities. And the final point before um, closing, um, and I thank you in advance for your patience already, is the monitoring uh, aspect. The data that can help monitor. It can help monitor regional integration, for example. And here I would want to show you the example of the African Trade Observatory that we are building for uh, the African Union for the implementation of the AFCFTA. Um, I won't go into detail on that, but there's two things that Monda mentioned earlier on that. I would want to flag and highlight of what the data can help you do. The first one is see on the right side, the tariff negotiation tool. Um, so what we see in a lot of countries and so also in Africa um, is that, you know, a lot of policymakers engage in, in negotiations and don't have the data to support making good offers. Um, for example, when it comes to tariff negotiations, um, agreements usually say something like uh, you liberalize at least 80% or 90% of, uh, of tariff lines. Um, and if you make a tariff offer, you have to actually have to calculate whether that is, <laughs> that is the case. And sometimes offers are made that are actually not in line with what the agreement says. When you design sen sensitive lists, there's all sorts of things that you may need to take into consideration uh, in terms of what is being traded, what will be the effect on it, on, on tariff revenue, and these, these sort of things. Um, so this is, again, data that we can automatically provide based on the, 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 the tariff information that we are having, based on the trade statistics that we are having, um, uh, where policymakers don't have to analyze manually what what's, uh, certain effects uh, tariff offers may have, but we can automatize that through the tools. And there's also the possibility to simulate, for example, tariff face downs um, over the future. So there's a tariff negotiation tool that we have built for the um, um, AFCFTA. And in future, um, there's also a monitoring tool. It's still work in progress. You won't see it online yet. Uh, but I meant to show here a few of the elements that we will be showing automatically. For example, when monitoring the effectiveness of regional integration, you want to look at the utilization rate of preferences. So this is real time data coming from customs to this tool. Um, and you may detect that some countries use preferences a lot and some don't, or some sectors do more than others, some types of companies more than others. Again, it gives you a lot of information how to maybe adjust and where to fine tune to make uh, the regional integration really happen. Uh, we will have information on tax revenue, border crossing times, and these sort of things. So all this data coming that we are collecting and that comes from customs can be used to monitor and to help policymakers make the right decisions and fine tune where necessary. And this brings me to uh, the end, what we wanted to present, uh, maybe just to add on that, yes, we also, I mean, uh, do obviously capacity building on all those areas that we just mentioned. And we are also very engaged in conceptual work, for example, on, on uh, classifications on non-tariff measures, um, developing new assessment methodologies, etc. I saw there was a researcher, a professor <laughs> also among the participants. So we are also very active on that more conceptual and theoretical front to help advance the analysis methodologies that exist. So I would want to leave it there. Um, we give your... Uh, our contact details and I understand there have been quite some questions already in the chat so we'll hand over back to the moderator. Thanks very much Monter and uh, Ursula for that uh, very uh, extensive uh, presentation. Uh, uh, there is obviously just a, an absolute wealth of information uh, that the ITC has collected. I, I can re remember back a number of years ago when uh, you started with Trade Map and it was already very <laughs> impressive. And now the, uh, the, the suite of tools has, has really expanded in, in, in very dramatic fashion. Um, also, congratulations on having reached uh, a million users. Uh, that's a, 
that's a very impressive number, although I, I confess that I'm not sure that USAID is utilizing uh, the resources uh, to the extent uh, that we perhaps should. And hopefully our session uh, this uh, morning today will, will, will encourage uh, uh, more uh, of, that, uh, of that exploration and utilization of the data. Uh, before we turn to some of the questions uh, that have already been posed in the chat room, uh, let me uh, encourage uh, participants uh, to uh, post comments and questions uh, that we will uh, get to uh, in the remaining time that we have. Uh, but before I turn to those, uh, I, I just want to make sure that uh, the wide range of participants here have an understanding of how they have access to this information. I know that for USAID, we, we have free and unfettered access uh, to, uh, uh, to this data, but uh, perhaps if you could just uh, make clear how others, uh, implementing partners and others uh, can access this information for their use, that I think uh, would be a good note to start on. So yeah, uh, I can maybe respond to that. So I mean, these tools are built, as Monda mentioned in the beginning, as global public goods. So the idea is really for ITC to provide information to those who need it most, particularly in developing countries. So um, registration is free of charge for all users in developing countries. Um, in developed countries, it depends a little bit. Um, there are some agreements with certain donor organizations, for example, um, to, to grant also access there. There's also licensing that we do, for example, for universities in, in, in some developed countries or national licenses for certain countries like Australia, etc. cetera. Um, that is then on a paid basis. So this is this solidarity in terms of um, access to the information. Now, this said, the registration is only needed for certain types of advanced information, for example, the national tariff line data in, in, in trade map, the company information, Wanda mentioned earlier, there's addresses, et cetera. This you need registration for. Most, uh, I have to say, of the information, if you go to market access map and you never have uh, registered, um, you will be able to access most the of the information like that as well. Now, we encourage you to register, A, because then we can count and then we can also see better. <laughs> who is using and we can get back to you to get uh, information on what we should improve so we do encourage you highly to register um uh, and and uh, to use it but it's free of charge for most of the world very good thank you so let's let's turn to some of our questions and 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 i'll start with one that i think is probably uh, beyond the scope of the session here uh, given its uh, sort of complexity but nonetheless adugna asks from uh, ethiopia uh, we are not yet. Uh, we have not yet joined the export market. Uh, what steps should we take uh, uh, to start exporting? I, I, I know that covers a lot of territory, and it's probably uh, more than a bit difficult to answer. But uh, if you could offer some, uh, sir, per perhaps some preliminary thoughts that can get people started, uh, I think that would be greatly appreciated. So uh, let me turn that over to either you, Montero, or Ursula. So I wonder if you want, but uh, I would say, I mean, I, I, if I understand correctly, this comes from a company. Uh, so basically you have a product and you have not joined the export market yet. Now, my recommendation is go on the Global Trade Hub desk, look for your product. And um, what Mona hasn't shown, um, what you can do actually, you, you type in your product and you can look what are potential markets. You say, I'm from Ethiopia, I have that or that product. And actually the Global Trade Hub desk shows you also potential markets. So for, given Ethiopia and that product, where are high is high demand for this. And then you can dig deeper in what is needed to access this. So that could be a starting point um, um, based obviously on, on the data, but there's many things that one should do when, when starting to export. Wonder. Yeah, uh, yeah, in fact, in line with what uh, Ursula said, it's interesting to see if your production cost is in line with the world demand. If you are yeah. above the market, you cannot export. Then and then you can start analyzing the the, the export uh, price of your competitor or the other uh, ex already exporter. Then if you think that and you can check what kind of norms and standards, maybe the norms that you are using are not in conformity with international demand. Then you need to assess all this dimension and to see if you have if you think that and it's not just thinking, but if it appears that you are in conformity with the rules and regulation and your your price is quite competitive then you start analyzing to which market you can export who is your competitor the, 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 and then to you can analyze also the the, the cost of exporting then uh, in fact 
we can help you on that. And what we do uh, in many countries, and we, we have even um, people working with us in Ethiopia, and we develop what we call the market profile. Yeah. The market profile, in fact, help you to assess the demand and the given. When you identify that there is a potential, let's say, in Uganda, then you know the demand change from one country to another. The packaging change, the needs change, the periodicity of the, the product change. Then we need to take all this into account. And this is what we include in our uh, market profile. We will be extremely pleased to help you. And uh, to, to if you contact us, you can contact our uh, market. You go to our market analysis tools. You can send an email and we have a team ready to answer to this kind of question. Thanks very much, uh, Montier and Ursula. Let me uh, turn to a question, well, a couple of questions, actually. Uh, one is from my colleague, Robert Parker in Central Asia. And Rob asks, has there been any evaluation of how effective the trade obstacles alert mechanism has been in the countries mm -hmm. where it's implemented and what countries in it is it in so far? And then let me add that uh, there's another uh, question that my colleague, Brian O'Byrne here in Washington asks about the trade obstacle alert, which is how does ITC validate a trade barrier complaint. Uh, so perhaps they could respond to those issues related to the uh, alert mechanism. Okay, I can maybe uh, respond to that. So uh, maybe starting with the second one. So how do we validate? We don't as ITC. <laughs> so already it's, it's a national mechanism. So we stay, help build the platform and the institutional mechanism, but it is national mechanisms that are led by, by, by the countries. Um, now the validation is an interesting one. So it's not, uh, maybe I should have been more precise on that when talking about trade barriers. So I'm not talking about trade barriers in the WTO sense of non-tariff barriers of, of things that should not be there by law. Um, and that are intended to obstruct trade. Now, for a business, a trade barrier could be such things that are not permitted under the agreements uh, or the WTO uh, commitments. But most often than not, the barriers that they are encountering in their experience uh, are, are things that, that are legitimate, but it's just practically a problem for them. Basically, for example, the time that it takes to get a certain certificate. Um, now, the validation is... Um, in, for example, the surveys, basically, we don't judge whether we think it's a problem. We ask the company what represents a problem to you. And that the answer to that is very different of whether you're a small company or large company. The very same issue can be no issue for a large company, like, uh, you know, the cost of $500 for a certificate of origin, a large company will say, oh, peanuts. Uh, and a small company tells me that for me is a problem. So it's up to me to judge, it's up to them. And that, that gives us information of who's struggling with what, and that we can feed back to policymakers. Now, the validation aspect that we have in the trade obstacle me alert mechanism by the National Focal Point Institution, it's some sort of webmaster function. So to make sure that people don't say, oh, I hate it, it's like for the third week in a row, it's raining. Um, nobody wants to <laughs> see that and see that published. So that sort of validation that happens and seeing is that a valid, is that a concern that concerns this mechanism? Can the institutions re respond um, um, to what you're posting there and to make sure that there's nothing offensive in, in, in what is being reported? So that sort of validation is there. Now about the effectiveness. Now we have to say that this obstacles alert mechanism is only meant as, as I said, uh, complementing uh, the other public-private dialogue mechanism. So it's just one of many channels that are being used in the countries where it's implemented. Um, we started in Cote d'Ivoire in 2014, and that was a pilot that uh, admittedly was not the most effective because we, we learned a lot on, on you know, what needs to be in place to make sure that it's being used. So first is the awareness that is out there. Then there's an issue of internet com connectivity. And uh, we had worked with a desktop version. We are now publishing also a mobile version very soon because uh, mobile penetration is much, much bigger uh, in Africa in particular than uh, um, uh, the desktop version that not so much used, for example. And it depends on the effectiveness of the response mechanisms because obviously companies only report or continue reporting if there's also response coming back. So we worked, most of our work nowadays is really around ensuring that these concerns are being taken up uh, by the relevant authorities. Now, what did help us a lot was the trade facilitation agreement and the creation of trade facilitation committees. And where we can, we anchor this reporting mechanisms into those uh, committee 
work or, or frameworks to make sure that, for example, reports are being addressed, for example, in those meetings uh, of, of NTFCs in, in those countries. Where it has been implemented, um, it's upon demand. It's really upon, upon request. Uh, we have now a big regional system in covering all countries in ECOWAS. We have a system in uh, Mauritius as well. And um, yeah, there's a few more in, in, in the pipeline, but it really depends on countries wishing to have such a system and thinking it would complement what they already have. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn now to a and question. Did you have something to say, Monter? Yeah, just to add one uh, point, Please. following what uh, Ursula said. In fact, it's extremely difficult to say that uh, this uh, measure is a barrier or it's, it's really difficult. And if you'd like to do it, you need to go through a very long process. But and what we try to do through our exercise, it's mainly to convince a policymaker and the exporting country that their business is facing barriers. It's about these kind of barriers that we are talking and very often they don't listen to that. And they, when we started this project, we used to hear complain against developed countries till we came with the proof that when you discuss with, and you, you have the representativity, when you tell them that 90% or 95% of the exporting companies in this sector are facing, are facing this challenge, then it become really an evidence. And yeah. this is how we manage to convince policymakers that very often the business sector are facing problems and very often also at least in half of the cases the problem is not located outside the country but inside the country and they can take a decision and in fact uh, what we have done with with you in the arab countries when you see that when you compare with, between different countries and you see that all exporters are facing the same challenge with an importing country this help you in your evidence-based decision or action to say that I'm not the only one facing this challenge. Many other are facing, and then this help you in your negotiation with the partner. Thanks very much. Uh, let me let me turn now to a question from uh, Kamran, a colleague who is in in Pakistan. I think he asks an interesting question. Uh, would you consider capital or information flows also as an area of interest from a trade perspective? Uh, barriers to free flow of capital and information are becoming problematic for development. And then I guess a related question, although not exactly uh, ex similar, is uh, from uh, Weika Odida, who says, are there any mechanisms to support startup capital financing? So uh, perhaps if you could uh, tackle those uh, two uh, related topics. Wonder. <laughs> okay, then uh, barriers for uh, free flows of capital. In fact, um, first of all, we have uh, now an application on investment. We haven't presented these. Yeah. And the idea is really to capture the, 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 the investment capital and all the, the, the inflow outflow of capital and investment. And this is really key. And we are doing this even at the company level. We, and uh, now we are going a little bit deeper. We know that it's needed and we start developing tool to identify potential to invest, that mean that how to attract investment. And we are developing, we have a big program that we are starting with EU. We are developing, helping countries to develop their capacity to uh, market their uh, opportunities and to, to, to attract investment, FDI. Anyway, then, and uh, under the new project that we are doing with EU, knowing that we are promoting a new value chain then an order among the, the obstacles that you have in the value chain is not about NTM. It's about your investment legislation. It's about the, 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 this, uh, the, the capital flow and the, the, the free uh, movement of capitals is a barrier for investing and promoting a new value chain. And this is what we are addressing under the new project that we are implementing now. But we are not doing more than that, but this is what uh, we are doing. Then the mechanism to support um, companies Capital or th th this is something that uh, our new ED would like to start. She would like to promote a new fund in order to support uh, companies and the creation of companies and um, expansion. But this is really a new initiative uh, hopefully in one or two years time, we can tell you what we are doing, but we are really starting in this area. 
Thank you very much. And uh, I know these are challenging topics uh, for all of us. So uh, it's not as if uh, we can expect you to have uh, all the answers, but it's good to know that uh, you are also sort of uh, focusing your efforts on some of these uh, important issues. Uh, let, let me turn to a question that I think that has been largely answered, but uh, uh, Bonaventure van de Haan asks, are there any tools, programs, services set up to support newly signed African free trade? Uh, you talked a little about the African Trade Observatory, but perhaps mm. you uh, would like to elaborate a little further. Yeah. yeah, maybe just, I mean, we have the links in the presentation, the presentations will be shared. So I actually invite everybody to look also at, at what is in there um, already. And there's also a lot of analyses that we're doing. For example, we have done over 20 surveys in, in Africa over the past years. And from that, we can look at what happens in intra-regional trade, what are the barriers to intra-regional trade, which is something that we will do over the summer. Um, and again, what can be done? Huh? I mean, the, the, the survey results are publicly available. Uh, there's reports for each of the countries. Again, um, the link uh, to the NTM survey website is in, in, in the presentation. So there's a lot in there that can already be, uh, be used and we are supporting as trade and market intelligence side of, of ITC on that. But then obviously there's the other parts of ITC um, that also help um, in the implementation, yeah. And maybe on the implementation of the African CFTA now, uh, it's somehow ITC baby and ITC got the mandate from head of states to develop the African Trade Observatory. It's, in fact, it's a monitoring tool to assess the regional integration. And um, we report directly to the AMOD, the AMOD of Ministry of Trade uh, Committee, and this uh, AMOD rep report directly to head of states. What we are developing there to monitor and to boost you know, the, the African uh, Union came with what they call BIAT, boosting the intra-African trade. And in fact, we developed a very ambitious program based on real-time data. And we can tell you now we have done this in four countries and we are supposed to do it in 45 countries. It's already working. And then I can tell you today the, the number of container that came to um, Uganda or Zambia, the cost by container, that how long they spend during the, the to cross the border, um, if there is any problem with the utilization of preference, if there is any problem of the the revenue, the fiscal revenue by uh, authorities, by port, by where, then all the information is uh, developed on real time. And this is a really a decision-making and tool that we are developing for policymakers in Africa. And the idea is really to identify as soon as they face any problem, to identify the problem and to help them taking the decision. And we developed with this some analytical tools, some uh, simulation tools as well. And we will do tomorrow uh, the launch of the third, there is three modules to develop for the business sector, the idea is to improve the communication in Africa about the, the intra-African potential. And the third one is really dedicated to policy maker and we will launch it tomorrow with Commissioner Mochanga and the, the EU ambassador, Mark Thank you. Um, from Eleanor Sonnen, we have a question. Uh, do you do capacity building for local institutions to do business surveys and trade analysis? I think you've touched on this again in your presentation. Yeah. But, uh, Very shortly, perhaps, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you want me to elaborate? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, we do, uh, particularly on the trade analysis. So actually, there's also another question I saw about, you know, on the tools, how can we use it? We don't know how to use them. So we do capacity building on all sorts. I mean, really the basics on how do you use trade map, what's in there, uh, you know, what, what kind of analysis can you do with this and on each of the tools we have that. Uh, we have capacity building around certain concepts, for example, market access, non-tariff measures, what are these uh, basic concepts, information sources, what to know, what is in notifications, for example, what you don't have. I saw a question early on the reliability of data, what are the data sources, what do I need to know about that? So all of that we do, we do capacity building on trade analysis methods. So the expert potential assessments, for example, example that we're doing we teach on those uh, market profiles Monda mentioned earlier so certain types of analyses that we are doing uh, we also build capacity for others particularly I mean, we're always looking for for clients on that because there's so much demand for it and, and we can't do it and we shouldn't <laughs> so we are good in Geneva for certain things but you know you are on the ground it's the countries uh, the business support organizations uh, the researchers on the ground that should be doing that so we can teach on methods we can give the data and then we'd rather have uh, locals do uh, do the work so we build capacity 
to that extent. Um, on, on the surveys, yes and no, um, because on the business surveys, usually they're implemented by ATC. Yes, we build capacity on of the interviewers, obviously, and how, how to do this. What we At one point in time, we wanted or we had an idea to have these surveys be run by business support organizations. However, we realized that in most developing countries, they don't have neither the funds nor the capacity to maintain high quality technical implementation because I mean, I don't want to go into the details of data quality control, especially from survey responses. I mean, if you want to go back to a government and say that bribes are a problem, <laughs> you'd rather be sure that this is true and based on good and representative sampling. So in terms of quality control and comparability of approaches and, and, and um, of data between countries, and again, I mentioned AFCFTA, now it's interesting to compare actually countries and bring things together. We usually centralize that, but we do have built capacities of, of, of institutions that did run surveys for other purposes, basically on how to sample. Final aspect of capacity building, we also help, somebody asked about the reliability of, for example, trade statistics and the sources. We realize, for example, particularly in services trade, <laughs> well, not so good. Um, so we have capacity building offers now also for national statistical offices because we've learned a lot on what to do and how to collect trade statistics, what to watch out for, how to detect outliers. This is what our statisticians do. So we share that knowledge with national statistical offices for trading goods and particularly for trade in services where there's also new methods and how to estimate trade in services, it's much harder than goods, um, uh, where we actually have big capacity building programs now that we are running based on methodologies that have been validated together with OECD and WTO etc so the entire variety of trade intelligence we are <laughs> we are sharing our knowledge to whomever is demanding it um, so if you're interested very happy to get in touch with you on those let, let me follow up Ursula if I may you're talking about the difficulty of collecting services trade which we're all familiar with and we all struggle mm -hmm. with and then we have sort of the added complication of trying to uh, sort of divine what's going on in the world of digital trade and e-commerce. Um, is that an area which is uh, starting to be integrated into your work? Uh, I know that you, the ITC has been doing some other kinds of efforts on uh, e-commerce. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could comment on uh, how you see that uh, information uh, being gathered uh, going forward, if at all. Yeah, in fact, uh, now we are, as you know, uh, Paul, the collecting trade and services data is quite challenging, even for developed countries. And we received a few years ago from no OECD countries a request to help them collecting trade and services uh, data. And uh, it's really time consuming, resource consuming. And then knowing that we think now we are doing quite well in goods, and there is a lot of demand on services, and we are we are pushing countries to diversify their economy and then they need to move also to, to more services and very often when we prepare strategy for them uh, the services is not known if you don't know really the information you cannot develop any strategy then we decided to go in this direction and now what we are doing we we developed a, a program uh, jointly with the uh, UNCTAD and WTO we are already collecting the data, but doing it at the aggregated level. And now we are moving with, we started with, with uh, six um, Eastern partner uh, country, among them Ukraine and other, uh, training them on how to develop the survey to collect services. We are working with Central Bank. We select two to three sectors and we train them to establish this and then we move to the other sectors then this is what we are doing now we started with uh, six uh, country in eastern uh, europe then uh, we got the funding to cover uh, eight mediterranean countries from morocco to israel and we just uh, signed a new contract with you for 10 african countries we don't know which country yet we need to assess normally in all countries we have experts to assess the capacity of countries. We prepare for them a full program and we start implementing it. It takes around 18 months by country to, to run this. Okay. And uh, then uh, the, the um, yeah, for sure, e-commerce is part of it. And, and this is what we are doing with uh, Central Bank. And it's, we do it on the basis of survey and we work uh, closely with the Central Bank. We have some e-commerce uh, program in ITC, but not linked to the statistics. It's, right, it's right, right. 
All right. Uh, thanks very much. And like I said, uh, that's that's an, that's also an issue that we're all sort of uh, focusing on and working on trying to sort of grapple with the uh, information or the absence of information, if you will, uh, in, in some of these areas. Uh, as a follow up to the discussion on capacity building, uh, uh, Weko adds again, uh, thank you for your responses. How can we access this capacity building as local organizations? Well, there's various ways. Um, I mean, there's sometimes capacity building programs that we have in country. So it depends a little bit on the country where you're at, because sometimes we may have already planned uh, uh, some of those capacity buildings. Now, nowadays, we run a lot of public webinars, especially on these simpler how to use trade map or something like that. Um, now, in the, one of the advantages of, of today's world is that people are, <laughs> are logging in more to Zoom um, and that makes it much more accessible. And, and if you're interested, for example, in, in, in specific topics, um, you can just let us know and, and we flag to you whenever such a session is coming up that is also accessible to you. If there's a wider need, for example, for a particular project, uh, obviously we're also doing capacity building as part of project implementation. And then, then it comes maybe even to contact us and to see what would be budgets that are related to this. Um, um, there is also um, yeah, capacity buildings that we particularly design. So you can actually get in touch with us. I mean, we, I put the contact details on the last slide. Um, um, but um, yeah, you just let us know what, what needs you have in that area and we can see what we can match it with. Maybe there's already ongoing capacity building efforts that we are doing. We used in the past, Paul, we used to have this regular uh, training for USAID staff. Uh, and we will be really pleased to to to, yeah. to, to read uh, this. Uh, and I see two uh, areas maybe. First of all, really helping uh, your colleagues in Washington and in the field, getting uh, all the most recent information. This will help them in all their program design. Um, and we have other projects that we are implementing. Uh, the good example, the one that we have done with you in, um, for uh, Arab countries, uh, based on uh, the NTM work that uh, Ursula's team managed to do in different countries, we managed to identify some key actions and we started together handling some of them. And we can give you this, if you have a program, we can prepare this for you and you implement the program. It's not about us implementing or we will be extremely pleased to share with you all the information that we have, all the diagnostics that we prepared, and hopefully this will help you in what you are implementing. We have seen a good example uh, of what we are doing in Bangladesh, what we have done in Bangladesh, following the NTM that we have done in Bangladesh. We have seen that the program that you designed there is based a lot on the survey and result and recommendation mean that there is continuity between the different institutions. And I think this is having strong synergy between us is really a key for uh, to, 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 to have uh, for the future. Right, right. Well, and, 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 and as I said uh, at the outset, I think uh, we really are, uh, are, 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 are in need of sort of uh, integrating uh, more of the ITC's capabilities and resources into our efforts uh, globally. And so, uh, I very much look forward to uh, our uh, being able to uh, revive our uh, in-person trainings and to make sure that uh, you and the ITC is uh, very much a part of uh, those, uh, those efforts uh, so that we can uh, uh, take advantage of work that, uh, that, that is being done. We're, we're coming close to the end of uh, our time, but there were two uh, uh, comments, I guess, really more than questions that I just wanted to share. Uh, one is uh, from Alicia Grimes, who is a USAID colleague here in Washington, who works uh, quite extensively on environmental uh, and environment related issues. And uh, she writes that uh, I'm particularly interested in learning more about how businesses are aware or are grappling with uh, legality requirements, including mm -hmm material identification and origin of the large diversity of wooden paper products under, for example, the US Lacey Act, uh, also emerging environmental services, goods markets, uh, carbon credits and related requirements. Uh, again, that's a very, very large topic. I know that the ITC is uh, initiating some more work on sort of the green economy, uh, mm -hmm. but I think, uh, that's an area where we all will be focusing more of our efforts uh, going forward. Uh, perhaps you have uh, some sort of preliminary comment on Alicia's uh, remarks. And lastly, yeah. before we conclude, um, Gustavo Cavero writes, uh, many USAID partners do not have knowledge on how to use these tools as part of their development projects. 
mainstreaming it in development projects could be a way forward. Well, hopefully that's what we've accomplished somewhat this morning by having uh, this presentation and uh, uh, hopefully raising the awareness among uh, a lot of folks about uh, the ways in which uh, these, uh, uh, these tools can be uh, uh, utilized. So with just a minute or two remaining, uh, Ursula, uh, Monterre, do you have any sort of responses or concluding thoughts? Maybe just on the environmental aspect. So yes, uh, we hear about that in the surveys. Um, so, so absolutely, we could also drill down deeper into what have people said about the United States. We are asking about the regulations, but also increasingly we hear about private voluntary standards that are being introduced. And also there's a, a tool that, that looks at those. Um, so this is clearly a, an area of concern. So other than that, from my side, um, do respond to the last poll because maybe it responds to one of the questions that you had on <laughs> future capacity building offers and yeah. sessions that we could offer to mainstream <laughs> tools. <laughs> yeah. well, once again, uh, Paul, thanks for this opportunity. Really, if we manage to, if we can redynamize the, 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 the relation between USAID and ITC, I think there is huge complementarity and synergy on what we are implementing. Uh, we would like to see if we can implement a system where we can inform you about what we are doing more regularly and maybe in both sides in order to, to help you in your implementation. It's not, not everything is about project or funding. It's about synergy in the field, having a better knowledge, having better information. And I think we have too much to do, both of us, and we'll be extremely pleased to, to, to join force with what all what you are doing in the field. And if we can support and work more closely together, it will be really great. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Ursula, uh, Bonterre, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time this morning, uh, for your very uh, exhaustive presentations, which uh, uh, we know uh, will uh, lead to uh, other uh, sort of opportunities to delve deeper into the resources that the ITC has. Uh, for those uh, who are within USAID, I just want to remind everyone that I serve uh, as the uh, point of contact uh, for a relationship with the International Trade Center. So if there are any uh, questions, uh, if there are any uh, opportunities for us to collaborate with you in the field uh, with work that is being undertaken by the mission, by other bureaus or offices here in Washington, uh, please uh, contact me, please reach out to me and we can uh, discuss that further. Uh, let me also say that uh, as I uh, said at the opening, uh, there's gonna be a lot, of more, lot more forthcoming content on trade issues uh, during the month of July on market links. Uh, so make sure to uh, keep your eyes open for blog posts and other kinds of content uh, that will be uh, posted uh, uh, throughout the month. And last but not least, before we conclude, uh, please make sure to complete the final question in the polls on your screen uh, so that uh, we can identify areas in which uh, there's an appetite for uh, more information, uh, more in-depth uh, exploration of issues that we've uh, touched on today. Uh, so with that, uh, let me thank uh, our ITC speakers. Uh, let me thank the production team from Market Links for helping put this event together. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in the not too distant future. Have a good day. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, my friends. On the screen, you will find that information, um, the marketanalysis.intrasend.org website, as well as if you are within USAID, uh, Paul's email address so that you may uh, contact him for more information. On the screen, we have just launched the poll for you. So we do ask that you enter that um, response in the radio button that associates with your most kind of preferred response. And in the chat, you'll notice we've also included the Market Links website where we will be posting the recording and any other relevant documents that have come up during this session on that website. Thank you everyone again so much for your participation, for your active attention, and we do wish you a great rest of your day, no matter where your feet find you. Thank you to all. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.